the importance of this tribunal, it goes ahead to say that it allows for at least one of the members to be a person who is not eligible about issues of HIV. It allows for the tribunal to have a member who has knowledge about the medical perspectives of issues relating to HIV and other members who are familiar with issues concerning HIV and the law. So the composition of this tribunal is one that comprises of experts that have got different expertise on matters living with HIV, but also ensuring that taking into account the principles of greater involvement of persons living with HIV, but also of meaningful involvement of persons living with HIV, it is always assured that a person living with HIV is represented on that particular tribunal. And the amount that I say is to look at any part of the law within the provision of the HIV Act that is violated. The only thing the tribunal cannot deal with is that they cannot deal with any criminal case that arises from the Act. So they do not have the power to deal with criminal cases, cases that would fall in the domain of a criminal uh, jurisdiction. Uh, the tribunal has been in place uh, since uh, 2012, if I'm not wrong, and uh, it came through a gazette notice from uh, Chief Justice then, and uh, since its inception, we will speak about it later, but they've gotten a number of cases uh, that have been reported to them, but this compendium was only able to cover the cases that have been finally concluded by the tribunal. So questions may be raised why only 13 cases from a period of 2012, but I'll leave it to the chair, current chair and former chair who will be, be able to explain the journey in terms of why that happened and some of the hurdles which most of the stakeholders in this room can be able to help the tribunal uh, to overcome in this particular situation. So what are the nature of the cases that have come before the tribunal? When you get your hands on a copy of the compendium, which we assure you that everyone will leave this room with a copy, you will notice that a number of the cases start on the issue of discrimination. Discrimination is an act of treating someone differently because of a perceived attribute they have. It could be their skin color, it could be their sexual orientation, it could be their HIV status. So in this case, we have seen a number of cases that touch on the issue of discrimination on the basis of a person's actual or perceived HIV status. So when you get the compendium, you will see a number of cases arising in that context. You will also see a second category of cases arising in the context of testing a person for HIV without their consent. And these are cases that are arising from medical facilities and also from relationships between employer and employee. We all know the provisions of the HIV Act in terms of Section 14 are quite clear that you must get the written consent of a person before you test them for HIV and you must subject them to pre and post test counseling. So again, those are some of the cases that we have seen that have come before uh, the tribunal. The third category of cases that you will see in the compendium deal with the issue of breach of confidentiality. Confidentiality is an act of keeping secret information that has been given to you in trust. And again, when you look through sections 20, 21, 22 of the HIV and AIDS Prevention and Control Act, we all talk about issues of our confidentiality. So we've had cases where people have had their status exposed to the public, either through publications, either through acts by other person, or either through the acts of their employer. Uh, welcome, Mr. Lachia. You have a seat right here. Uh, the result of this is Kelly's board chair and also the past chairperson of the HIV Tribunal, but most importantly, the Gormalia chairperson <laughs> <laughs> defending this past time. So, welcome, Mr. Lachia. Uh, we go on back to the serious business of dealing with breach of confidentiality, and uh, this is one issue, and you will see in one of the cases that I truly applaud the tribunal about that, beyond going to say that confidentiality has been breached, in one of the cases the tribunal talks about the need to have regulations to guide the issue of breach of confidentiality. 
So for the colleagues who are here from the various agencies in the UN, from agencies from government, this is one area that has been quite problematic, that the law provides for regulations to be in place uh, so that they can ensure that if there's any breach of confidentiality, that is taken into account, but those regulations have not been put into place. And of course, we are expecting a judgment on the 7th of December before the High Court around this particular issue, but we are glad that the tribunal has already been able to reinforce the importance of having regulations in place to guide the issue of breach of confidentiality. Uh, closely related to breach of confidentiality is the issue of termination of employment on the basis of one's HIV status. We have seen and you will see cases before the tribunal where people living with HIV are dismissed from employment just because of their HIV status. We all think in this age and day of time when they are available, available when we have what stigma that this is something that will not be able to happen when you have a strong constitution and strong employment laws. Again, this is something that you will see going over and over. So this means the role of the law, access to justice, still remains extremely important in terms of dealing with this. Now, the last and interesting thing that has arisen in almost any case that has come to the tribunal has been the issue of whether the tribunal has jurisdiction to listen to certain types of cases. There have been questions raised whether the tribunal has jurisdiction to listen to cases that touch on violation of human rights. There have been questions about whether the tribunal has jurisdiction. Jurisdiction for those who are the non-lawyers basically means do they have the power, do they have the authority to listen to these cases and then be able to make a decision. So there's also been questions about do they have the jurisdiction to listen to the cases that touch on matters of employment because we already have an employment and labor relations court that's supposed to deal with issues of employment. Then there's a question that has come and even has been decided by the High Court saying that the tribunal does not have the mandate to listen to cases that touch on human rights violation because matters concerning human rights according to the Constitution must then be addressed by the High Court and can only be addressed by a lower court once an act of parliament delegates that particular power. But again, and I'm sure Mr. Alba will speak to this, the issue of breaching confidentiality is a breach of the right to privacy in the Constitution. So you may have breached a provision of the HIV Act but still have violated a provision of the Constitution. So that is one area that will also need to be addressed. And for the legislators we have invited to this meeting, we have already begun discussions with them to see are there possible amendments that will be made to the HIV and AIDS Prevention and Control Act to expand the jurisdiction of the tribunal to be able to hear cases concerning human rights in the context of issues relating to HIV. So who have been the people filing and being sued in this particular case? Interestingly enough, all cases have been filed by persons living with HIV, which is an extremely good thing, meaning that Many of them are beginning to know their rights, and many of them are beginning to recognize that. The only worrying part about that is that we've not seen organizations, we've not seen civil society organizations, we've not seen other partners take this forward, and that poses a question for consideration. Uh, how come civil society have not filed cases before the tribunal? How come we haven't had other agencies file cases before the tribunal? Is it a lack of knowledge on how to find the cases, or is the tribunal only limited to persons living with HIV, which is not the case? So you will see from the compendium that you will get that those are the cases that have come before the tribunal. And the other flip side to it in terms of who's being sued, we have medical facilities, private and public hospitals are subjects of lawsuit before the tribunal. Uh, you will see the names, let me not say them here, but they are already in the compendium. You will see employers, both from the private and public sector, are subject to litigation before the tribunal. Interestingly enough, you will see a case dealing with an association of persons living with HIV that have been subject to litigation before the tribunal, again on an employment and discrimination matter. Quite worrying to have an association of persons living with HIV being sued for breach of uh, employment and the right to work. We also have religious institutions that have been subjected to litigation and you will read a quite interesting case concerning, I will not name the institution, 
but you will read quite an interesting case concerning how a particular religious institution dealt with an employee who was living with HIV. And then we also have non-governmental organizations, which again we will not name because some are quite reputable, that have also been brought before the tribunal for breach of confidentiality. And we have one case touching a county government, again, coming before the tribunal. So you can see the audience of the people who have been sued are quite white, varied, surprising, and also interesting. In my life as a lawyer, I would be only thinking about how do we get more lawsuits to address this particular issue. But having worked with the world and being a programmer, the question then becomes what kind of programming needs to be done with employers, what kind of programming needs to be done with religious institutions, what kind of programming needs to be done with association and networks of persons living with HIV, what kind of programming needs to be done with NGOs working in the health sector to understand and be able to respect the rights of persons who are living with HIV. And so that again becomes a role that all the stakeholders in this room would then be able to take. What role do the communities have to be able to interact with this particular group of people? So as I conclude, the major remedy that has come from the tribunal is mostly monetary compensation. The tribunal has, in a number of the cases we have reported, awarded monetary compensation to people, and will soon be hearing from people who have had the privilege of litigating or having their cases before the tribunal.